All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Amy Haas. Uh, I'm a research professor in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science at Penn State University. Uh, and I work with my co-authors uh, here, Dr. Shoba Contrabinta of NOAA NESDIS and Dr. Hai Zhang, who um, also works with NOAA NESDIS, on a, um, a NOAA product to basically ensure that NOAA aerosol satellite products are accessible and formatted correctly for air quality and atmospheric uh, data users in the United States. So I'm going to talk today uh, about aerosol observations from the new GOES-R series of geostationary satellites. Uh, so satellites are um, useful because they identify aerosols in the atmosphere. They can show the location and the transport of aerosols um, on a, a much larger scale that you can really get from any other source. And so the, the actual scale is going to depend, of course, on the type of, of satellite. But with geostationary satellites, we're talking about continental and hemispheric scale. And so when we say aerosols, we mean um, uh, aerosols from things like smoke plumes, either from large wildfires or agricultural burning, um, blowing dust, which can be localized, or it can be dust that's transported over long distances. You can see the example here. This is from the, the figure, the satellite image is from August 23rd, so last month. Uh, and this is an example of showing the, the continental transport and location of smoke plumes. Those are those gray features there um, across the continental United States. And so this is a geocolor image, and I'm going to talk in much more detail about the types of images that uh, and data that we can get from the ABI. But this is just an example showing the, the real strength of this satellite imagery, which is that you can get this larger scale information. And so satellite aerosol products, they have many applications, of course. Um, so some of the examples are operational forecasting. So using it for ambient air quality as well as aviation related to visibility from aerosols. Um, uh, satellite aerosol products are also used in numerical models, so both as validation of numerical model output and also as part of the modeling process with data assimilation. Also, public health and epidemiological studies um, often use satellite data because they get, again, they give a regional view, whereas um, often on the surface you just have these point measurements that have more of a, a sparse distribution. Uh, and then, of course, anytime there's a large environmental or atmospheric um, event, like a large wildfire or some of these large dust storms, um, the media, as well as outreach from uh, local and regional and national governments, um, satellite imagery is extremely useful in those applications as well. All right, next slide. So um, again, this is focusing on geostationary satellites. Um, I know Powen had an introduction last week to geostationary satellites, so I don't want to spend too much time, but I just want to remind everybody that these are the meteorological satellites, and because they're in a high altitude orbit, the orbital speed of the satellite matches the rotational speed of the Earth. So that means that there's essentially continuous measurements of the same uh, location on Earth. And so these are hemispheric, giving hemispheric coverage. So typically you're getting a hemispheric view centered on the equator. Um, and then the figure there, this is an example from, the, again, the, the GO-16, the GOES-R series of satellites showing the hemispheric view just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. All right, so the next slide. So specifically, today we're talking about the GOES series of satellites. So these are the geostationary operational environmental satellites. They're the U.S. geostationary weather satellites. They're administered by NOAA, the National Atmospheric and Oceanic Administration. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about the new, exciting um, GOES-R series of satellites. But just to give that some perspective, I wanted to talk about the legacy imager instrument on the GOES, and that's what gave us our information about uh, aerosols in the, in the atmosphere prior to this new uh, technology. Um, so the legacy GOES imager only had five broad spectral bands, and you can see them listed there. So there was a visible band, a shortwave infrared, water vapor, and two longer infrared bands. So the bands are sometimes called channels. Those are, are synonyms. Um, and so in terms of, of the legacy GOES imager, we had um, te a temporal resolution of anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours. So temporal resolution is how often um, we have the observation, so the refresh rate, you can think about it. In general, the smaller or the shorter the time period, the better, so the more frequent observations that we get. And the spatial resolution of the legacy ghost imager was anywhere from the, the products from one kilometer to four kilometers to eight kilometers. And spatial resolution, that's the smallest area that the satellite instrument can resolve. 
So again, the spatial resolution, the smaller the number, the better. That's the higher resolution, the smaller number. And then with the figures, though, you can just see there's, um, there's always uh, two operational goes at any one time, and there's additional ones that are used as spares and, and for additional information. But there's always a goes west that you can see the, the coverage there that's centered on 100, 137 degrees west latitude, and then goes east, which is centered on 75 degrees west latitude. All right, so next slide. So now that we've kind of set the stage while talking about the legacy GOES imager, I want to talk about the new uh, revolutionary series of GOES, which are called the GOES-R series. Um, so the, the tagline here with the GOES R was that it was like from going black, going from black and white television to HD high definition television, just in terms of the volume of data and the accuracy and resolution of the data products. So the GOES R series is actually a series of four satellites. So the the individual GOES R satellite launched on November 19th, 2016. And it was renamed GOES-16 after launch, and it is operational. It's, it's now GOES East, so it's in that 75 degrees uh, west uh, longitude uh, position. So again, in the figure on the right there, you can see the, the coverage of the GOES East satellite. Uh, and then GOES-S, which was the next in the GOES-R series, was launched on March of this year, March 1st, uh, 2018. And it has been renamed GOES-17, um, but it's still in its checkout orbit, so it hasn't become GOES-West yet. Uh, but the plan is to move it into operations to that 137 degrees uh, launch, west longitude location sometime late this year, so late 2018. And then there's two more satellites in the GOES-R series. So there's GOES T, which is scheduled to launch in 2020, and then GOES U, which is scheduled to launch in 2024. And you probably noticed that the, the trend here. So the, the GOES satellites, they have letter designations like R and S before they're launched, and then when they're launched, they, they get a number like GOES 16 or GOES 17. All right, so moving on to the next slide. So specifically, I want to talk about the new generation imager instrument on the, the GOES R series. This is called the Advanced Baseline Imager, or ABI for short. Uh, there are six instruments on the GOES R series satellite. You can see them all on the figure there. Um, but the ABI is the one that we focus on that's used for the, the aerosol observation. So the revolutionary uh, aspect of the ABI is that it has 16 spectral bands or spectral channels. Remember, I showed you those five broad spectral bands on the legacy GOES imager. Uh, so in general, we're thinking about spectral bands, more is better. All right. So with the 16 bands, that gives us new products that we've never had before. It gives us higher accuracy, both spatial uh, and uh, 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 spectral resolution as well. Uh, also, in addition to that, there's a faster scan rate with the ABI compared to the legacy GOES imager. And what that means is that we have higher temporal resolution as well. So we have more frequent observations compared to the legacy GOES imager. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. And also, that means that we get routine CONUS view, so continental United States, as well as that full hemispheric view um, that I've showed you. So that's really exciting. We get these additional views that we never had before, at least not routinely. All right, so in the next slide, so this is just an example of the, uh, the views that the ABI gives us. So there are several different what they call scan modes of the ABI, uh, but this is an example of scan mode three, which is called flex mode, um, and it's the default op operational, excuse me, scan mode of the ABI. And so what that gives us is it gives us the full disk for that whole hemispheric view every 15 minutes. Uh, and so you can see in the figure, so the figure is, is showing the, the, the coverage of the ABI. So with the full disk, those, those kind of darker blue areas, that um, the colors correspond to the approximate pixel area. So essentially that's kind of thinking about the spatial resolution. So what's the, the smallest area that the, the satellite can resolve? So the blue areas give us essentially uh, about one square kilometer. So they're higher at higher resolution. But when you get out to the edges, the, the pixel sizes quickly start to get very large, so we have lower resolution in those areas. So you can see essentially that's why this is goes east, right? So it's focused on the eastern part of the United States as well as the Atlantic Basin. All right, so then we also have the CONUS views every five minutes. And so the CONUS is shown by that rectangle with the white uh, dotted line outline, and that's roughly 3,000 kilometers by 5,000 kilometers, that rectangle. Uh, so that's every five minutes. 
And then also new with the ABI, very exciting, we have two mesoscale scans that are available every minute. Uh, and these are approximately 1,000 kilometers by 1,000 kilometers. And you can see those smaller um, white squares there that have the solid outline in the figure. Uh, and these are adjustable. So the, the full disk view is always going to be the same. The conus view is always going to be the same in terms of the, the area. But these mesoscale boxes can be adjusted and moved based on whatever's happening currently that, that meteorologists or others want to focus on. So for example, right now, Hurricane Florence is out in the Atlantic. And so one of the mesoscale scans is focused. It's over Hurricane Florence to give the, the hurricane forecasters more information about Florence. All right, so again, comparing this to the legacy GOES imager, what we had before. So we, we only got a full disk scan every three hours compared to every 15 minutes now, and it took 26 minutes for that to happen. So with the CONUS scan, it was, you know, the time was about the same. It was seven minutes compared to five minutes now, but we only got one every 30 minutes. So the, the temporal resolution was much, uh, much lower with the legacy GOES imager, and we didn't have any of these routine mesoscale scans. So really, um, we have a, a much higher observation rate with the ABI compared to the legacy GOES imager. All right, so the next slide. So this slide is just kind of a summary of what I've said in the past few slides. Um, just to give you a little more visual you know, summary of what I, I've just been saying. So on the left, we have those cubes. And essentially, what the, the, the cubes are showing is that the red cube is the legacy GOES imager compared to the, the five times higher uh, temporal resolution of the ABI, the four times greater spatial resolution of the ABI, and then the three times more spectral resolution of the ABI shown in the yellow cube. Um, and again, so not only do we have this higher resolution across the board, but we also have a much higher volume of data. So that yellow cube kind of represents, compared to the, the red one, the, um, the, the, the huge increase in the volume of data with the ABI compared to the legacy GOES imager. So in the middle, you can see uh, a list of the spectral bands or spectral channels on the ABI uh, in microns. Uh, you can see the 16, they're listed there. And the yellow highlighted ones are the, the corresponding ones that we have with the legacy GOES imager. So again, roughly only, uh, or excuse me, only five with the legacy GOES imager compared to the 16 that we have with, uh, with the ABI. Uh, and then finally, the charts on the far right are, are just kind of showing a comparison between what we have the legacy GOES imager in terms of the aerosol, uh, different aerosol products, uh, and then the different views, the CONUS, the full disk, and the mesoscale views, compared to what we're getting with the GOES R series, the ABI. Uh, and so what I want to do now is I want to talk specifically about what these different products are. So aerosol optical depth, or AOD, the geocolor imagery, the dust imagery, the dust RGB, and then aerosol detection, which is a smoke and dust mask. All right, so let's talk about, let's really get into what these different products are. All right, so the first one I want to talk about is geocolor imagery. Uh, and so what geocolor is, is that it's, uh, it's essentially analogous to true color imagery, if anybody's worked with that before, uh, with any of the polar orbiting satellites, the VIRS or MODIS true color image, for example. So what it is, it's a combination of the red, green, and blue spectral bands of your satellite instrument. But the reason we call the ABI geocolor and not true color is because the ABI doesn't actually have a green band, so it's simulated. So even though it, it looks like true color, it's technically not a true color. Um, but that's just kind of a fine detail. Essentially what you want to take away from the geocolor is that it looks like what you would see with your eyes. So if you were looking down uh, from space at the Earth, you would see essentially what you see with your eyes. So that means that clouds look bright white, smoke is a, like a more diffuse gray feature, Blowing dust is kind of a brown. And then, of course, land looks either green or brown. Uh, the oceans and large uh, water bodies look blue. All right, and so you can see there's an example um, here of the GO-16 ABI geocolor imagery. And this is from last August. This is August 25th, 2017. Uh, and this has four kilometer spatial resolution and 15 minute temporal resolution. Um, and again, this is a new product from the ABI. We didn't have this with the previous GOES imager. And it's pretty spectacular. So in this case, this, in this particular day, um, hopefully you can see Hurricane Harvey uh, just making landfall or approaching the Texas coast. 
Uh, so this, that's one of the kind of the main feature of interest on this particular day and why we picked it. And I think there's also, yeah, it's a little hard to see, but there's also some smoke plumes um, in kind of central and eastern Canada that are moving uh, southward. Those are kind of a, a grayish feature. All right, and then at night, I just want to mention, um, at night, there's a multispectral infrared imagery that shows low-level liquid water clouds and high-level ice clouds. And this is moving kind of fast, but when you see when the Terminator moves, you can see a little bit. There's kind of this peachy uh, sort of feature, and that's some of the clouds that are being shown um, during the nighttime imagery. All right, so next slide. So again, um, for those people who aren't familiar with, with GeoColor or TrueColor, um, it's abbreviated RGB, and that's for red, green, and blue. Those are the, the spectral bands that are used to make the imagery. I'm just showing some of the different features that you can see in this type of imagery. So again, clouds are bright white. Um, urban haze is more of a diffuse uh, sort of uh, uh, feature. Um, smoke is, is gray, it's, so it's, it's more uh, thick, it's less transparent than the haze. And then sometimes you'll see this uh, anomaly called sun glint. Uh, and so that's, that's essentially the reflection of, of sunlight uh, reflecting off water. And this is an artifact of the image. Um, and so if you see kind of these shiny brownish colored areas in a, a geocolor or true color image, that's due to sun glint. All right, so next slide. So let's move on. So our next product is called aerosol optical depth, or AOD. So this is a quantitative measure of aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, and it's made, it's, it's essentially a measure of the, the, the instrument. It's measuring the scattering and absorption of visible light by aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, and so it's unitless. Um, typically values, they, they can really range uh, quite a bit, but they usually range from about zero to one in the United States. And so what this means is that if you see areas of high aerosol optical depth, in this example here, it's a rainbow scale, so they would be colored red, orange, or yellow. That indicates areas of high aerosols in the atmosphere, so typically either from smoke, smoke aerosols, dust aerosols, or haze aerosols. Uh, the thing to remember with aerosol optical depth, it's, there's no AOD retrieval, so AOD isn't measured in regions that are, have cloud cover or they have very bright surfaces. And that's because these are very reflective areas. And so the, the, the instrument, the algorithm, basically can't separate out what's being reflected either by clouds or the surface compared to what is going on in terms of the scattering and absorption of light by the air. Uh, so in this image here, you can see this is from this year. This is from August 23rd of this year, um, when there was a very thick smoke, um, very uh, expansive wildfires in the Western US and Canada. Um, I see these, these extensive red areas are corresponding to very high AOD associated with smoke from those fires. And you can see intermixed with that um, are some uh, white, bright white cloud areas where the aerosol optical depth is not retrieved, so there's no AOD measurements in those areas. All right, so um, the, the really exciting thing about AOD from the ABI instrument is that it has very high accuracy and high spatial resolution, and of course, temporal resolution. Um, compared to the previous ghost imager. Um, so this is just kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. So on the left, we have aerosol optical depth from the previous ghost imager. So this has four kilometer spatial resolution, 30 minute temporal resolution, and it's a lower accuracy product. Because again, remember the legacy ghost imager only had five broad spectral bands. Um, so that essentially means that you have a lower accuracy product. And that's compared to for exactly the same day, the same time, the same observations. On the right, we have the GO-16 ABI. So it has much higher spatial resolution, two kilometers compared to four kilometers. Higher temporal resolution, so we're getting 15 minute observations every 15 minutes compared to 30 minutes. And it has a high accuracy AOD from a multi-channel al algorithm, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Um, now the thing is, it, it, you know, don't pay too much attention to some of the missing data. And we've got some weird artifacts, like little boxes that look like they're flickering uh, on the ABI data. Um, this was, again, this is from last year. So this was when um, the aerosol optical depth data were just very preliminary. They were only beta maturity. So there are some issues. There's some missing data. There's all this flickering. But what I want you to notice is the, the difference in the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution. So we're getting much more frequent observations with the ABI. And because the spatial resolution is higher, you can resolve some of these fine features of the aerosols moving over Michigan compared to the more coarse uh, resolution that we have with the legacy GOES imager AOD on the left-hand side.
All right, so don't pay too much attention to the, that flickering and some of those missing data. That's all been taken care of now. All right, this is just an example. Okay, so let's talk about what it means that the, the GOES-R series, the ABI AOD algorithm, it uses a multi-channel AOD retrieval compared to the legacy GOES imager, which, which couldn't because there just weren't enough channels to do that. Um, so there's separate AOD algorithms over land and over water. All right, that's an important thing to remember. Um, and this is similar to MODIS and um, the VIRS uh, AOD algorithms. Again, those are all those are both um, multi-channel instruments, so they're much more similar to the ABI compared to the legacy GOES imager. And you see some of the references there if you want to really dig into the details about the the, the algorithm. Um, so what, what the multi-channel means is that there's simultaneous retrieval of AOD and aerosol type, that's a smoke or dust map, we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a few slides, um, by comparing calculated and observed reflectances at multiple wavelengths. Um, so let's just go through an example, um, hopefully a very simple example, hopefully try to, to try to illustrate what I mean by that a little bit. So on the right you see the figure. This is just a very simplified example of how the multi-channel AOD uh, algorithm works. All right. So this example that I'm going to go through is for two aerosol models and two ABI spectral channels. But remember, there's actually um, 16 spectral channels. Um, and then also, um, you can see uh, on the right underneath the figure, uh, for the ABI algorithm, there's actually nine aerosol models over water and then four over land. So this is just with the two and two, this is just a, a simplification, but it's just for hopefully to, for clarification purposes. All right, so on the figure on the right, the curves, um, those black and red lines, all right, those are the aerosol models. So the black line represents aerosol model one, and the red line represents aerosol model two. And then we're also, again, we're using two different reflectances or two different bands. So on the y-axis, we have band two, and on the x-axis, we have band one. All right, so let's imagine, uh, I'm gonna, hopefully this will work. Okay, let's imagine that we have an observation, okay? So the observation is that blue dot there. We've made an observation. So using um, band one as the, or excuse me, um, yes, using band one as the observation, okay? So model one gives us an AOD, that's the black line, of 1.6. So remember, AOD doesn't have units, so it's just 1.6. And then model two, the red line, gives us an AOD value of 1.0. Okay, so that's those following those arrows up to where they intersect with uh, the, bla the black line and then the red line. All right, so then the question is, so now we have basically we have two answers for what the AOD is for this observation. So the question is, well, which one is correct? So what we can do is we can figure this out by simulating the band two reflectance using the AODs as input. So how do we do that? So we look at what the AODs tell us that the band two reflectance should be. So we get two different answers, all right? So um, using model one, we get a reflectance in band two of 0.17. And then using uh, aerosol model uh, one, the black line, we get a reflectance of 0.24. Okay, but we have an actual observation, right? So we know what the answer is. And the answer is actually 0.19. That's this um, kind of bluish line here that's intersecting with the y-axis. All right, so because the observed value is closer to band two, simulated using, using aerosol model two. So that means in terms of the AOD, our answer is that our derived AOD is, is one, using um, model two, which is the red line, okay? So again, this is a, this is a, a gross simplification of how the multi-channel um, algorithm works, but hopefully it just gives you an idea of the strength of having these multiple channels compared to when we only had the five spectral bands of the legacy goes imager. Okay, uh, so uh, there was a, a heritage ABI AOD algorithm, so kind of what, um, what we inherited when the, the satellite was first launched but it's in the process of being updated with what's called the enterprise or EPS AOD algorithm. Uh, and the strength of, well, there's a, there's a few strengths of the enterprise algorithm, but the, one of the big things is that it's also running currently on the, the new generation polar orbiting satellite, SOMI NPP or SNPP. And there's also NOAA 20, which is the, the next in that series of polar orbiting satellites. And it's running on the VIRS instrument there. Uh, and so the strength of the EPS algorithm is that it's capable of retrieving AOD over bright land surfaces. I don't know if you remember on slide 12, I told you that there aren't AOD retrievals where clouds, where there's cloudy areas and also over bright surfaces. 
Well, the EPS algorithm goes a long way towards um, uh, taking away or ameliorating the bright surfaces effect. Um, so what you can see here is um, the figure on, figures on the, the far right uh, that are labeled B and C. These are taken from a paper by Zhang et al. In 2016. So there's the kind of the legacy Beers uh, aerosol optical depth retrieval, which is on the bottom, the dark target, the Beers DT there. So you can see there's a lot of um, AOD missing from a, a this is a dust storm uh, over the, the continental U.S. Compared with the Beers Enterprise algorithm, the EPS on the top, you can see the AOD, those kind of red and, and uh, yellow and orange and turquoise colors are retrieved over that area. So that's the strength of the EPS algorithm. It's, it has much greater coverage over bright land surfaces. Uh, so we want to basically take that strength and, and bring it over to the ABI AOD algorithm as well. And then the, the, other, the other advantage here is that we have, if we have similar algorithms running with ABI and Beers, um, then they can be used synergistically in various applications. And what this table in the middle here shows, um, these are the, uh, the bands, the spectral bands, from the VIRS instrument, that polar orbiting satellite instrument, that are used to create the aerosol optical depth retrieval, as well as do some of the, the internal tests to check for things like cloudy uh, clouds and, and bright surfaces. Um, so these are just, this is just to show you the strength of the multi-channel, all the different channels, the bands that are used to make up the uh, aerosol optical depth algorithm. And so th this will be a, there'll be a similar chart for the a ABI AOD. The main difference being that the 0.5 uh, micron channel, that's missing in the ABI. Again, that's the green channel that isn't available from the a ABI. Okay. All right, so just one more um, uh, validation or uh, aerosol optical depth algorithm slide. So I just want to point out that um, with this slide, basically with the legacy GOES imager, we had aerosol optical depth from that, but it didn't have to meet any sort of speci specifications or requirements in terms of the accuracy or the precision of the aerosol optical depth product. But because um, with the ABI, we have this multi-channel retrieval, there are now specific requirements that the, uh, the AOD product has to meet. And that's what this, just these plots are showing, that they're meeting those specifications. So in this specific example, um, the ABI AOD data um, are validated using Aeronet AOD, and Aeronet is a, is a series of ground-based um, uh, surface uh, spectrom spectrophotometers. Um, essentially, they're measuring AOD from the surface. And so they're the, the ground truth for any sort of satellite AOD, all right? Um, and so, there, again, there's different AOD algorithms over land and over water, and they have different specifications, different requirements, and they have also have different requirements based on the size of the aerosol optical depth, all right? And so this is just, again, this is just an example here. I'm showing, essentially, the point of the slide is showing that the, the AOD has to be, they have requirements, they have to be validated, and right now they are meeting those requirements. And so we've got... The, the plot on the left shows the AOD over land. So the requirement there um, for that uh, specific size range, AOD of 0.04 to 0.8, that um, the accuracy requirement is 0.04, and the bias in this plot is 0.029, so it's meeting that. And then on the right, it's the AOD, same thing, but it's the AOD over water. The requirement there for AOD less than 0.4 is, um, is 0 .2, 0 0.02, and um, the, the plot shows that that's meeting that. Okay. All right, so let's talk about now. So that was all aerosol optical depth. Um, and there's, there's the, the most work is being done on that because it's a quantitative measure of aerosols. So aerosol, aerosol detection is a complementary product that's a qualitative measure of aerosols. So it's kind of like a yes, no, like heads up um, sense of, you know, are there smoke or blowing dust plumes in a particular area? Um, and so this product is derived using, again, in mul multiple channels from the ABI. Um, it's derived using spectral and spatial threshold tests based on uh, ABI measurements in the visible and the infrared. And so what the smoke mass does is it indicates smoke plumes, uh, essentially from you know, large wildfires or agricultural burning. And that um, is colored in shades of pink or magenta. And then the dust mask indicates blowing dust. Uh, and that's colored in shades of yellow and brown. Uh, and so you just you can see an example uh, on the, the right there from August 17th of this year uh, when there were a lot of uh, uh, smoke plumes, and that's the, the kind of the reddish, pinkish, magenta colors. And there was also some blowing dust, and that's the yellow and orange and brown colors. 
All right, and, and think about this, this is a new product from ABI. We didn't have this from the Legacy Goes Imager. All right, so let's just show a couple of examples. And again, like with that um, previous aerosol optical depth example, um, these were from last year, so the ABI aerosol products were still beta maturity, so they were very uh, preliminary. So don't, don't focus too much on any um, you know, errors or missing data here. What I want to show you is not only that these are new products, we've never had them before, but also the strength of the geostationary satellites. So we have the high temporal resolution so we can watch the evolution of these events. We can track the motion of the plumes and also the higher spatial resolution so we can really resolve finer features of the aerosols and the plumes compared to what we had before with the legacy goes into the all right, so just a quick summary. So on the left, this is the dusk mask. So don't focus on the red, uh, the kind of there's some red uh, areas over the, the Gulf of, of California. Uh, so this is uh, the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. So New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and northern Mexico. This was a dust storm from March 31st to 2017. Um, and hopefully you can see the brown colors indicating the blowing dust. Uh, over uh, New Mexico, moving into Texas, and then extending down into northern Mexico. All right. And then the smoke mask on the right, uh, this was the West Mims fire, which was burning uh, and producing smoke along the Georgia-Florida border in May 2017. Um, and so, again, you can see this is the, the, the smoke mask. It's those red colors indicating the smoke from that fire um, extending out and moving um, eastward across uh, Florida and out into the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. All right. So another one of the new products that we're really excited about is dust imagery. So it's called dust RGB. And again, remember RGB stands for red, green, and blue. Uh, so it's some combination of different um, uh, channels of the instrument, spectral channels of the instrument to make a red, green, and blue, uh, some sort of visible imagery. Okay, so in this case, the dust RGB is made from a combination of three of the ABI's infrared spectral bands. So it's actually using the brightness temperature at 8.4, 11.2, and 12.2 microns. Those are the bands. Uh, and so the cool thing about the dust RGB is that it indicates areas of blowing dust in the atmosphere. So it's similar to the dust mask, but it's more uh, more quantitative, really, than and it has you know kind of higher or, or wider coverage compared to the the dust mask. Um, and so when you see blowing dust in the dust RGB, it appears as a magenta feature. And again, I want to stress this is a new product. This isn't something we had from the Legacy Goes Imager. Um, and so hopefully you can see there the the um, the, the kind of the figure there in, in the middle of the page. So this is the same event that I just showed. So this is the dust storm on March 31st, 2017. So it started in Mexico and extend, and then it, it continued into New Mexico, and then eventually moved into Texas. Uh, and so hopefully you can see that magenta, that kind of bright pinkish colored plume as it's moving across Mexico, New Mexico, and Texas. The kind of rusty colored features that are moving, those are clouds. And then the surface changes colors kind of from like a cyan or turquoise to purple, depending on the temperature of the surface. So as essentially as the sun comes up and the surface warms, it's going to slightly change color on the background of this bright magenta, bright pink dust plume that's moving. And then for comparison, there's the, the corresponding uh, polar orbiting satellite observation, the MODIS true color imagery on the right there, showing the dust plume. So it's kind of this you know, yellowish, brownish feature over New Mexico, Mexico, and then moving into Texas. But again, with the polar orbiting satellites, you just get one snapshot. With the, the ABI, you get to see the con almost continuous measurements. You can see the formation of the, the plume, its movement, its evolution, its features. Okay. All right. So just to summarize up, just to, to kind of, you know, let you know where we are now in terms of the, the, the product maturity. So um, we're focusing on four different products. So we have the GeoColor, the aerosol optical depth, the smoke and dust mask, and the dust RGB or the dust imagery. So we have two um, routine views. So we have the full disk view, and then we have the CONUS or continental U.S. view. So in terms of spatial resolution, um, the, the full disk has four kilometer, all the, the products have four kilometer spatial resolution. The CONUS, um, the geocolor is one kilometer resolution and the other products are two kilometers. 
In terms of the temple resolution, the full disk, again, we're talking about scan mode three, that's the default operational mode. So the, the temple resolution is 15 minutes for all the products. And for the CONUS, again, with scan mode three, the temple resolution is five minutes. Um, and I just wanted to make a point. I'm going to talk about um, a website called Aerosol Watch, which is where you can access um, already prepared imagery of the CONUS view and the full disk products. Um, but on Aerosol Watch, we only have uh, the, the products updated every 15 minutes. Um, and that's just to make the data loading and the data, the volume of data on the website manageable. But don't forget that the actual native resolution of those CONUS products is five minutes. All right, so if you went, you went and downloaded the raw data, you could get observations every five minutes, okay? And in terms of the maturity of the data, so remember I showed you already some, some examples of products from last year when the, the data were still beta maturity. They were essentially the, the, the first products we were getting. Um, as of July 21st of this year, the maturity for all the products became provisional. And what that means is that you can use them now for scientific applications. All right, so there's a final level of maturity, so that's final maturity, um, and that will be, um, so the, the, the ABI products are all expected to reach that maturity status sometime late this year or early next year. Okay, so now I have a whole bunch of really cool examples, um, which I hope you'll enjoy. All right, so specifically, I wanted to focus in on one application. Remember at the beginning, I talked about that, you know, there's many different applications of the, the satellite aerosol products. Um, so my research and my work focuses on air quality. So I just wanted to use that as an example um, of one of the applications of the, of the ABI products. Um, and, and that's really because smoke, blowing dust, and haze, these atmospheric aerosol, aerosols, they affect air quality. All right, so the aerosols in the atmosphere, I'm sure many of you know this, are made up of particulate matter. Um, and particulate matter is um, either solid, liquid, or mixed phase particles. Um, you know, so there's a wide variety in the chemical composition, the sizes, the phases of, of particles in the atmosphere. So they can either be primary particles, which means they're directly emitted into the atmosphere, or they can be secondary particles, which means they're formed by chemical reactions, chemical processes in the atmosphere. All right. So in the United States, um, the, the, the U.S. focuses it on two different sizes of particles, and they're called criteria pollutants, meaning they pose a hazard to, to both people and the environment. Um, and so those, that's fine particulate matter, which is abbreviated PM 2.5. That 2.5 means um, uh, particles with aerodynamic di diameters of 2.5 microns or less. And then there's coarse particulate matter, which is abbreviated PM 10, and that 10 indicates those are particles with aerodynamic diameters of 10 microns or less. All right. And so the, 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 the concentrations, the surface concentrations, the ambient air quality is communicated to the public. Uh, using what's called an air quality index or AQI. And I showed an example of the AQI on the right there. And this is just, it's a color coded scale um, because the, the pollutants, the criteria pollutants all have different uh, units of measurement. So it's much easier for the public to understand something that is dimensionless and that, that's tied to color. All right, so the thing to remember with the, the AQI scale is that the green and yellow colors are essentially safe for everybody. But once you start getting to orange and then a higher, so orange, red, purple, maroon, that's when the ambient air quality starts getting dangerous, okay? Um, so at the orange level, um, the, the observations, the current conditions are exceeding what's called the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for that particular pollutant. And that's essentially a health standard um, below which no adverse health effects are expected. Okay, so, so basically your hotter colors, your orange, red, purple, and maroon, those are the ones that we want to watch out for when we're talking about air quality. Okay, so smoke is an issue for air quality because smoke contains primary PM 2.5 and PM 10, so there's smoke aerosols that are directly emitted from the fire, and also um, smoke, or um, you know, the plumes, the gas plumes that are coming out of fires also contain pollutants that will form secondary PM 2.5 as well. And then blowing dust, of course, that's again, that's a primary pollutant. So those are dust aerosols that are affecting both PM10 and PM2.5 air quality. In the United States, um, the lo there's local sources primarily in the southwestern U.S., so that's arid regions, there's dusty regions there. And then also it can be more of a regional or, or, or hemispheric problem. In the United States, we can get Saharan dust transported from Africa. We can also get um, uh, dust that's transported from Asia across the Pacific Ocean as well. 
And then haze is it's much less of an issue in the United States compared to recent years. Um, but of course, haze is, a, is an issue, you know, globally, especially in Asia and China and in India, for example, can have very serious haze problems at certain times of the year. Um, so haze mostly contains secondary PM2.5. So again, this is not directly directly emitted. It's, it's formed in the atmosphere. And these would be nitrate, sulfate, and organic carbon particles primarily. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So here's an example of a dust storm in the southwestern U.S. Um, this was on April 12, 2018. And there, um, up in the top right, you can see the daily um, PM2.5 air quality index. Um, showing um, a lot, quite a bit, a swath of, of code orange, and then some red and maroon areas right around Phoenix. Um, and so again, once we get above orange, that's when we were violating the health standard for that particular day for PM2.5. All right, so this is a serious incident. And so again, we're looking at the dust RGB here, and you can see that you know the timestamps as we're moving through uh, every uh, 15 minutes. All right, and hopefully you can see kind of right in the middle, right around Phoenix and Mesa, uh, this magenta plume that, that starts up and forms and starts blooming across. Um, these kind of more rusty uh, brown colored features that are moving through, those are clouds. And then the, the kind of turquoise or cyan and purpley colors, that's the surface, um, the temperature of the surface changing during the course of this measurement. All right, so again, with the dust RGB, the strength of this, there's, there's several things we're getting. Um, to see the evolution of the plume uh, as time goes by, which we don't get with a polar orbiting satellite that just gives us typically one observation at a, at a specific moment in time. Um, also, uh, you know, we, we're, we're being able to observe this, uh, this dust storm at a time when we might not have a polar orbiting satellite op observation. So really the strength here is the the, the temporal resolution and the, the more frequent observations compared to what we would get with other satellites that might be available. Okay, so now let's talk about some wildfires. Uh, last summer, uh, anybody who lives in the US or Canada will probably remember that there were pretty serious wildfires raging last summer, uh, kind of August and September of 2017 in the Western US and British Columbia. So there was a huge um, area of high pressure over the Western US um, that, that stayed there for, for quite some time, which means there, essentially what that means is there was a record-breaking heat wave in the Pacific Northwest um, of the United States. And the cities of Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon were hit particularly hard. Um, they had days of code orange and code red PM2.5 air quality. And again, orange and red, those, those are, are, are when we're exceeding our health standard. Um, and so this is just an example that I'm showing for August 2nd. I'm going to show some more examples in a second. But just to give you a frame of reference, you can see the daily observed air quality um, was in the orange and red range for Portland and Seattle and most of, of Washington State, actually, on that particular day. And then there's a corresponding example of a true color image from the Veers instrument, so uh, you know the corresponding polar orbiting satellite. And this is just showing some of the extent of smoke on this particular day. So the smoke is the, that kind of grayish uh, features, and you can see there's some, some clouds and some um, other uh, bright white features there. Uh, and then the little red dots are the locations of the fires indicated by satellites. All right, so there's a lot of media coverage with this particular event. Um, and so just as an example, these are all from the New York Times, but on the top um, we have Mount Rainier, that's a, a famous mountain in Washington State near Seattle. And so on August 1st, when we still had good air quality, the smoke hadn't arrived yet, you can see a nice clear uh, view of Mount Rainier. But on the next day, August 2nd, which was corresponding to the images I showed you in the last slide, now uh, Mount Rainier is completely obscured by thick smoke. And then moving on later in that same week, the smoke um, continued to, to linger over Seattle and then had moved down to Portland, Oregon. You can see the, 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 the basically the, the atmosphere is obscured by this thick smoke from the wildfires. Okay, so this is pretty cool. So hopefully this will work on um, this, this animation. Um, so remember I talked about one of the applications of the outreach at the, at the very beginning of the presentation. So the New York Times picked up on the new GO-16 ABI observations last summer. Um, and so they had a really nice article. The link is right there. Um, so they had this loop of the observed um, geocolor ABI and the, the red fire hotspots, uh, the locations of the fire sent by the satellite, looping all the way from August 29th to September 5th. And so I'm kind of just letting it run through here. You can, you can see uh, as I'm talking, you know, the, the smoke plumes emanating from the fires. It's just, it's just fabulous to see. And then that smoke transport moving kind of both south 
and then westward into Montana and, and further west, in, in, or excuse me, eastward into Montana and then further eastward into the, the CONUS. Um, so this is just really cool to see that the ABI made it to the New York Times. Also, you can kind of see right in the middle of the slide there, there's a, a, a little map showing the smoke and other particles in the atmosphere. And what that is, that's an eight-day average of the, the ABI AOD um, over that particular area. So that's what that shading corresponds to. So this article had both the geocolor and essentially the ABI AOD in, in one place. So, so that was pretty cool to see, to see that um, kind of reaching the, the public um, via the media. Okay, so getting back to the, the uh, the AOD product itself. This is just an example uh, of an animation, a loop of the observations of the geocolor and the AOD for September 4th, 2017. So again, there I'm showing the daily average observed PM 2.5 index. You can see there's quite a broad area of code orange, red, um, and uh, purple uh, observed air quality uh, corresponding to the thick smoke. Um, and again, I, I don't want you, this, this was last year, this was the beta maturity, that early maturity data. So there's a lot of um, AOD that's missing um, and there are some kind of flickering and other things. So I don't want you to focus on that. I just want you to take away the fact that, you know, we have this high temporal resolution, high spatial resolution data. So we can really see the, the smoke plume you know, it's transport, it's movement across the continental U.S., and then pick out, um, you know, many of the fine uh, resolution features of the smoke plume as it's moving across the, the continental U.S. And this is totally unprecedented. We didn't have anything like this with the legacy goes in the jar. Okay, um, so we had a similar incident this past year, so July and August of 2018. There was actually another even worse round of wildfires in, in many of the same places in the western U.S. and British Columbia. At one point, there were more than 500 fires burning in Br British Columbia. And the Mendocino Complex Fire in California, in Northern California, is the largest, it's become the largest wildfire in California history. Um, so at one point um, in August, there were hundreds of flights that were canceled due to low visibility from the smoke uh, in Seattle, at the Seattle and Vancouver airports. So there were days of code red, purple, and maroon PM 2.5 air quality. And in fact, on August 20th, um, in terms of the whole, looking at the whole world, air quality across the globe. Vancouver, British Columbia had the worst air quality in the world, and Seattle, Washington had the fourth worst air quality in the world. So that's how bad the smoke from these fires was. Um, and the figure there, this is just another NOAA product. Essentially, the shading is showing the extent, the location of smoke plumes, and then the red dots show um, the, the locations of the fires that were, were producing the smoke. And this was from August 17th, 2018. All right, so once again, just like last year, there's a lot of news about the fires. Um, so just a couple of things here. One of them is that the, the smoke actually made it all the way to the mid-Atlantic, to the eastern part of the United States. People could smell it. Um, it was, it was kind, of, uh, kind of wild to think that smoke from the western part of the United States could make it all the way to the eastern part of the United States. And again, there's some more cool pictures of Mount Rainier. Um, basically, the one that I have here is just showing, someone took it from an aircraft, a commercial aircraft, showing the very tip of Mount Rainier poking out over the, the essentially the ocean or the sea of smoke that was surrounding it. Okay, so let's show um, some of these nice animations that we can see. So we can, sh we can basically follow the, um, the movement of the smoke plumes using the, the ABI aerosol optical depth as well as the geocolor imagery. And so this is an example from August 14th of this past year. And so again, there you can see the daily average PM 2.5, whereas that smoke was mixing to the surface and it was really affecting air quality in the Western U.S. and British Columbia. Uh, and actually, so there's kind of a break. And then the smoke had actually made it to kind of this, on this particular day, the, the central U.S., so the, the Mississippi River Valley and part of the Great Lakes, it had mixed to the surface as well. And you can see that hopefully in the animation with the, the red and orange and yellow colors of the aerosol optical depth moving over Michigan, kind of that Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis area. All right, one thing I want to mention, you'll notice that the aerosol optical depth cuts off. So essentially, once we get to kind of Wyoming, Utah, any further west than that, we don't have the aerosol optical depth observation. And that's because, remember, remember when I was talking about the scan rate, and we get to the very edges of the scan, kind of the, the western U.S., um, that's where the pixels get really high, and where, you know, the, the spatial resolution gets low. 
So with aerosol optical depth at that point, the, the view angle is so large that we can't accurately retrieve aerosol optical depth. So that's why there's a, a cutoff in the observations kind of once you get to the, the Rocky Mountains area. So once GOES-17 becomes GOES-West and we have observations from there, then we'll have the observations from that satellite that'll fill in what's missing right now that we see with GOES-16. Okay, so I'm running out of time. So actually, I think I'm going to skip this slide here. Um, but this is just another tool that we use um, to try to figure out where smoke might be going and if it's going to be affecting the surface. So it will be impacting surface air quality. Um, and then there's just some more examples. Um, so this is just uh, later that same week. So the smoke kept moving eastward. And by August 15th, it was impacting um, the mid-Atlantic region and kind of parts of the, the southeastern U.S. And again, you can see that um, on the animation of the AOD, that kind of those kind of yellow um, and some red colors moving into kind of the New York, Philadelphia, uh, Delaware, New Jersey area. All right, and then we had, so we had a little bit of a break. That was August 15th, that week. Then the next week, so August 20th was a Monday, um, we had another round of smoke that started to make its way eastward. Um, on this particular day, it was really impacting kind of the, the Rocky, the Rocky Mountains area. So you can see North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Denver, um, some of those areas uh, where we see the high, the, those kind of red and orange colors of aerosol optical depth in the, the ABI imagery. Okay. All right, and then this is the same day, so I'm going to back one. So this is this is August 20th. This is showing the aerosol optical depth in the geocolor. We could also have the ability to overlay observed hourly surface PM 2.5 observations. And so again, you can see where, th this is nice because it allows you to see where the smoke is mixing to the surface. So with the AOD, we're just seeing kind of where the locations of the smoke is. And we might not at the time know whether it's mixing to the surface. But if you overlay the surface PM 2.5, um, anywhere, again, you see kind of the yellow, orange, red colors. Those are higher concentrations of PM2.5 at the surface from the smoke mixing down. Um, and anywhere you see kind of a green color, that means that the smoke is still aloft and it's not impacting the surface yet. Okay. All right, so quickly, I'm going to do um, hopefully a, a very quick um, uh, tutorial on the, the Aerosol Watch website. But if you Google NOAA Aerosol Watch, um, you'll come up with this new website, um, and for best results, you want to open it in Google Chrome. All right, and then, so it has the CONUS views, and you can look at the different um, GO-16 uh, aerosol uh, layers. And you can also overlay VIRS from the polar orbiting satellites if, you're, if you would like to. And then there's also full disk views as well. Okay, um, so this is just showing uh, uh, how to access the, the actual data files. Uh, unfortunately, the AOD data aren't available yet because they just um, recently, July 24th, achieved their provisional maturity, but they're going to be available soon. And when they are, you can go to the class website listed there, um, and you can download the, the AOD data directly if, if you so desire. All right, just a quick update on the, the status of GOES-17. So remember, GOES-17 is the one that was launched in March of this year. It's going to become GOES-West, hopefully later this year or early next year. Uh, there's a problem with the cooling system on the, the ABI on GO-17. And so the bottom line is that um, it's affecting the infrared channels, uh, especially at nighttime on, on the ABI on GO-17. And so the ABI is probably not going to be able to make all the measurements that it was designed to. Um, the estimates are that it'll be missing maybe 10%. Uh, compared to what we're seeing with GO-16. Um, but the good news is that it shouldn't affect the, the aerosol products from GO-17. So once um, uh, GO-17 goes into operations, it goes west, and we start getting the, the preliminary aerosol products, uh, we'll be able to fill in those gaps that you saw kind of in the western U.S. where the GO-16 ABI cuts off because the view angle is too high and we can't retrieve the AOD. Okay, so just to sum up, um, you know, we're just, we're so excited. There's revolutionary new products or high accuracy products or high spatial resolution products, okay? So the AOD is a quantitative measure of aerosols, and with the ABI, we get that multi-channel aerosol retrieval, which is much, uh, which is similar to the, the MODIS aerosol optical depth and Beer's aerosol optical depth from the polar orbiting satellites. So it's completely different from what we had before. And then we have a bunch of new products. So we have the smoke and dust mask, which is a qualitative measure of aerosols. 
We have the dust imagery, which indicates blowing dust. And we have the geocolor imagery, which is similar to true color imagery that gives us a visu visu visual excuse me, indicator of smoke, blowing dust, and haze. Those three are all brand new products that we've never had before from a geostationary satellite. It's very exciting. Um, and again, just stressing, now we get routine full disk, we get uh, continental US, and we get these mesoscale views with the GO-16 as well, and GO-17 once it becomes operational. Um, so let me talk about the Aerosol Watch website really fast. So what will happen is you'll get this, when you open Aerosol Watch the first time, you'll get this little screen that asks you to select the, the range of times that you want. Because again, we have observations every 15 minutes. Um, so if you just load everything, it kind of slows down the website. So my recommendation is to look at the most recent observations, but obviously it's going to depend on, you know, what your application is. So let's take a look at maybe from 14 UTC to the most recent ones look like at 1630 UTC. All right, so you select your start time and your end time, and then you hit submit. And so those are going to load up. And the CONUS view is the default, and the, uh, the VIRS ABI geocolor imagery is also a default. So that's what's loading here. So it'll just take a second. Uh, so we're going to see the CONUS, we're going to see there's a, a series of fronts along the east coast of the United States right now, so we're seeing um, all the white bright clouds associated with that. Florence is going to show up in a minute here, the hurricane out in the Atlantic, and then there's another area, it's not quite a, a tropical system, but it's an area that the Hurricane Center is watching um, that's moving into the Gulf of Mexico here. Okay, so once it all loads up, Actually, even while it's loading, I can show you a couple of things. So you come over here on the right, there's all the different options of the imagery to view. So we're going to focus on the GO-16. So as I mentioned, the geocolor is the default, and it's colored green, indicating that it's on. Okay, the red, the red indicates that that layer is off. And if you hover over the layer, it'll give you uh, information about that particular product, um, give you a little um, guidance. Okay? So let's do, what I like to do first is I actually like to come down and turn on the labels layer. That just gives you the, the state and national borders. So you kind of have a, you know, idea of exactly where you are, what you're looking at. Um, and then let's take a look. Let's overlay the aerosol obstacle depth here. And so once you click a layer, it's, um, it's color bar or indicator will, will come up. And it might take a few minutes, not a few minutes, a few seconds for the AOD to load. Um, but while it's doing that, let me show you the animation controls. So what you can do is you can press play here, this forward arrow at the top. And so it's going to uh, move through the animation uh, period that you selected initially. So you can do a couple things. You can slow it down. Uh, let's do that first. So that's this, this um, double arrow here. So you can slow it down, which I like to do, just to have it go a little slower. Or you can speed it up. That's the forward double arrows. Okay, you can stop it if there's a particular, um, you know, image or, or time that you want to focus in on, and then you can advance or go back one, one time step at a time, which can be nice. It can be helpful, too. Um, and the AOD, for some reason, of course, because this is a live demo, it's loading very slowly, um, but normally it's very quick. But again, because we're doing this live, of course, this is when everything is going to slow down. But you can see it's starting to fill in a little bit here. So when we have the aerosol optical depth, it'll cover the same um, uh, 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 region here. And we'll have either the aerosol optical depth. You can also have, um, we have some composite imagery as well. So that kind of eliminates some of um, missing AOD associated with clouds. So it's an average of the last three hours, I believe. Then there's the dust RGB, and then we have that smoke and dust mass. And then the fires are those um, hot spots that are sensed by, um, by the satellite indicating the locations of the fire. Okay. So um, because we're running out of time, I just wanted to mention, too, that there's a full disk view. So if you come to the top right, you'll see full disk. So you can click on that. Again, of course, because it's a live demo, it's very slow, but normally it's quite quick. Um, and you'll see the full disk, the hemispheric view. Um, some examples that I, I showed in the, oh, sorry, let's turn off the AOD. A little load a little bit faster. The hemispheric view. And this is really useful um, when um, either smoke or dust is coming from someplace outside the CONUS. Um, as I mentioned, often we'll have dust coming from Africa or from Asia. Uh, and then we have a lot of fire activity in Mexico and Central America, particularly in the springtime. And so that can affect folks in, the, in Texas and the Gulf Coast. And so it's helpful to look at the full disk 
to see that. And then also, again, during the summertime, often we'll have uh, smoke that's coming into the conus from Canada, and the full disc can be very helpful with that as well. So I would encourage you um, to just take some time and play around with aerosol watch. Um, as I said, normally it loads much faster. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can feel, feel free to email me or contact me um, if you have any questions about how to use the products or how to uh, interpret them. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple additional features you can save. And it, you know, once you get an image or a configuration that, that you like, you can save it. Uh, there's some additional documentation, and then there's also the trajectories, which I skipped in the presentation today, um, but those just give an, an idea of the forward motion, both vertically and horizontally, of areas of high aerosol optical depth. Does anybody have any questions? Sorry, I ran a little bit over, but I, I get excited when I talk about the, the ABI products, because they're so cool. All right, let's see if we can put this in motion. Okay. Yeah, so, so that you can put the full disk in motion as well, and so you can see the movement of features. In this case, the, today the big features are Florence and then Isaac and Helene, the uh, two additional hurricanes that are out in the Atlantic Basin. And as I mentioned, that one area, that's not quite a tropical system, but it's, it's an area that the National Hurricane Center is watching that's moving into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you question one. Yes, so you mentioned that AOD is uh, dimensionless. Is the scale bounded to a specific interval? Yeah, that's that's going to just going to depend on where you are, uh, essentially in the world, how how um, high the AOD is. Typically, it ranges from zero to one in the United States, but it can be higher um, in places where the aerosol optical depth is very high. So often um, in Asia. Uh, particularly in the wintertime, um, there'll be very serious haze events, so haze mixed with smoke in India, for example, and so then the AOD can be higher than that. Um, certainly in um, the heart of some of these wildfires that I showed from this past summer, the AOD will be higher than one. All right, question two, is the daily PM 2.5 AQ map derived from the air quality forecast model? No, it's, so the air quality index is a dimensionless scale that US EPA, the US Environmental Protection Agency, developed to communicate both current and forecasted uh, ambient air quality to the public. And so what it's based on is it's based on the concentration of the specific pollutants. So you saw the dimensionless scale, so 0 to 50, 50 to 100, 101 to 200, for example. Each of those color-coded dimensionless index scales correspond to different concentrations of pollutants. So there'll be a concentration range for PM 2.5, for example, for, it'll be a different one for PM 10, a different one for ozone. All right, so they're scaled to the health effects and the national ambient air quality standard, the daily national ambient air quality standard for each of those pollutants. So typically the, the break point from code yellow to code orange corresponds to the daily national ambient air quality standard for the particular pollutant. So they're not derived from a model, they're derived from the, the health standards that are set by EPA for each of the, the criteria pollutants. All right, so question three, how does US EPA use satellite data in conjunction with their ambient air monitoring network and data? That's a good question. Um, they, there's a couple different ways. So, um, EPA has a uh, project where they've used satellite data to essentially, they, they take the satellite data and they fuse it with the ground-based monitor network observations so they can fill in the gaps in the monitor network because the pollutant monitors are primarily focused where the most people live. So in urban and suburban areas. So there's large parts, large parts of the country, particularly in rural and mountainous areas where there aren't any surface ambient monitors. And so US EPA um, has developed this fused product that attempts to provide information about surface pollutant concentrations, particularly PM 2.5 and PM 10, um, in areas where the, the surface monitor network is, is sparse. Um, also, US EPA, in partnership with NOAA, uh, runs an operational, two operational uh, air quality, numerical air quality model. So there's an ozone model and there's a PM 2.5 model and they also have smoke and dust models as well. And so um, 
the this the, the, the team that runs the numerical modeling program uses uh, satellite data in some cases as, uh, as part of the data simulation process, and they also use it to verify the model output as well. Okay. Uh, so that's question question four. On aerosol watch, will you likely have the option to overlay Go 16 and 17? Yes, we will. So again, Go 17, it's not operational yet. It's still in its checkout orbit. Uh, so it hasn't been moved to its, its final goes west uh, orbit location of 100 and, uh, what is it, 173 west longitude. But once that happens and we start, uh, the, the, the aerosol products start flowing, uh, a, we'll be able to put them on aerosol watch. So you'll be able to have the observations from Go 16 and Go 17 as well. Um, which is going to, which will be really fantastic. So we'll have essentially the whole whole conus. Uh, we'll be able to have the the aerosol optical depth and the other aerosol product uh, continuous observation. Question five: With the ABI dusk mass, might it be possible to track dust plumes across the Pacific Ocean using Goes West? Yes, absolutely. So um, the dust mass will be useful for that, and then also the um, uh, the, the dust RGB might even be more useful because that's a little bit uh, higher accuracy product compared to the dust mask, which is very qualitative. How can we verify, question six, how can we verify that the atmospheric dust in the atmosphere or after deposition over the ocean is not interfering with the chlorophyll remote sensing? Oh, I'm afraid I can't answer that. That's, that's definitely beyond my sphere of influence. I don't really um, know much about um, chlorophyll or uh, sea surface uh, remote sensing, um, but I can tell you that the dust, the so the dust RGB is made, as I mentioned in the presentation, using uh, three different infrared channels, so the brightness temperature at three of the ABI's infrared channels that are most sensitive to dust. Um, so I think the question would be, do those channels also, um, are they also sensitive to chlorophyll? And I, like I said, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and then also with the, the, the dusk mask, which is the, the aerosol detection product, that again also used, uses um, uh, ABI channels in the visible, visible and infrared. So I can find out and, and get back to you about that. Um, I think that's a good question because, um, you know, certainly along the coastlines, people, you know, might be, be interested in that aspect. Okay, question seven. What other quantitative parameters can be derived using the current remote sensing technologies? For example, any concentrations of PM2.5 or gaseous pollutants? So yes, well, concentrations of PM2.5, absolutely. That's the, the aerosol optical depth. That's the quantitative measure of aerosols. And there have been a lot of, um, it's been a very active area of research. Um, basically, how you take aerosol optical depth and, and correlate it with surface PM2.5 observation. So that's, that's well established, that relationship. Um, in terms of the gaseous pollutants, that's more of a problem because, um, you know, if you're thinking about ozone, for example, um, most of the ozone is in the stratosphere. So um, any sort of ozone that's happening in the troposphere or the boundary layer, it's, it's almost impossible, or certainly very difficult um, for uh, satellites to resolve that information. Um, there are some new satellites that are going to be being launched in the next several years that um, do have some promise to, uh, they're geostationary satellites, and they have promise to um, resolve some of these gaseous pollutants in the, the troposphere and the boundary layer, like ozone and carbon monoxide. Um, so there is some information, but the problem is it gets difficult to uh, for the satellites to resolve those gaseous pollutants on a you know a high enough temporal or spatial scale that they can be useful for observations or for forecasting. Okay. Question eight: Can we obtain the ABI aerosol products in real time? Yes, that's what's on the Aerosol Watch website. I apologize if I didn't make that clear. So when you open up Aerosol Watch, you're getting the the real time observations that were made today, this morning. In this case, because we're it's at lunchtime, um, the latency is about 20 minutes. Um, so I think that when we saw when I pulled it up, the most recent observation was from 12:30 p.m. local time, my time, 16:30 UTC. So, and that was about, you know, it was about a little bit before one o'clock p.m. when we were pulling that up. So, yes, that's where you want to go to get the real-time ABI aerosol products. It's, it's fabulous. But, you know, we have, we, it's just, I, I get so excited. So, we have high temporal resolution, we have the high spatial resolution, and we have the, the low latency. 
Okay, question nine, what is spatial coverage? Is it available for Asia? No, it's not because again, this is a US, um, the US uh, GOES series. So they're focusing on the observations either on the east or the western part of the United States. But there is an analogous satellite, uh, the Himawari satellite, that has very similar um, uh, uh, imager instrument that um, does provide coverage over Asia. So you should, you should check out the Himawari satellite. Okay, question 10. Is there a way to know the size of particles from the AOD measurement? Is there a suggested algorithm? Yeah, and that, that's related to the question I answered before. So there's been um, a, a wide range of research taking the AOD, taking AOD measurements and then um, uh, uh, making them analogous or, or corresponding to the, the surface PM 2.5 observation. So we don't have that information yet for the ABI AOD because it's such a new product and it only just became a provisional maturity so that the data could be used for scientific purposes, such as relating the AOD to surface PM2.5 concentrations. So we don't have that process set up yet for the ABI, but um, it's very, oh, there's an RSET, oh, and there's an RSET webinar on that topic. Okay, so I'm not even gonna talk about it anymore because there's an upcoming webinar about that. But um, if you look at the webinar, that whole process will be um, applied to the ABI AOD once those data um, have final maturity. Does the aerosol watch cover every part of the globe? No, again, because this is a geostationary satellite, so it's just focused on the Western Hemisphere. So those images that I showed at the beginning of the, the coverage of the satellite, um, it doesn't have global coverage, it just has hemispheric coverage because it's a geostationary satellite. Um, what is the difference between AOD and AOT? That's an excellent question. They're essentially synonyms. So aerosol optical depth and aerosol optical thickness uh, they uh, they mean the same thing, so there's no difference between them. Can there be a negative AOD value? Um, not technically, um, you know, because again, this is a measure of the scattering and absorption of light, uh, visible light by the aerosols. Uh, so that's why. Um, so sometimes you'll see, like I think the the scale can go down to minus 0.05. Um, but you know, technically, again, you're thinking about these as being positive values. Uh, from what time period is AOD data available? So again, the satellite launched in uh, November of 2016. Um, so if you're talking about the AO, ABI AOD data, um, we have data going back from, uh, from last year, from 2017, but those are the beta maturity, the, the very preliminary data, and they're not to be used for scientific purposes. So if you're thinking about using your data for some sort of science application, the AOD became provisional on July 24th of 2018. And so that's the, the beginning of the time period for which you want to consider the AOD data being available for, from the GO-16. Okay, question 15. Can I download the AOD information on the South America region to integrate with GIS software? Yes, um, but again, that, that's, you'll want to go to the NOAA class website for that. But because the AOD data just became provisional in July, they are not yet available from class. You can't download them yet, but in a couple of months, you will be able to. They will be available. The actual data files will be available from the class website. Okay. Uh, question 16, what data, repo oh, oh. what data repository does the GOES ABI data reside? I'm looking for level two, level three type data. Again, that would be in class, the NOAA class uh, website uh, data repository, but they aren't available yet because they only recently became provisional. And again, the difference between the beta maturity, that initial maturity and the provisional is that the beta maturity um, really can't be used for scientific applications. They're just, there's too many problems and issues with the data. <clears throat> and you saw some of those examples I showed you, those case studies, there was flickering and missing data. So you really need to use the provisional and then final maturity data for any sort of science application. All right, those are really good, question, good questions from everybody. Anybody else? Okay. Well, again, you can always feel free to email me or you know email the RSET team and they can get um, any questions to me. If you, for example, are using the Aerosol Watch website, you check it out, which I encourage you to do. Um, and you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to, to contact me and I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everybody, bye-bye.